Hello and welcome to Story Radio, the podcast for readers, writers and lovers of short stories everywhere. Today we're going to be listening to Stray Dogs and Cowboys by Steve Wade. Stray Dogs and Cowboys Just being alive felt like an act of betrayal. The accident happened that very day 17 years ago. Not a day went by, not a waking hour during every day of every week in all those months when the images of Khan didn't come to Limog, Khan's father. Khan is a small boy in a cowboy outfit on his rocking horse. Khan in a light grey communion suit posing for photos in the church garden. Or Khan in his early teens with his boisterous young pals during haymaking. But every image, every sound and scent memory led, as always, to the inevitable grotesque collage, Khan's 19-year-old body lying lifeless next to the green harvester, with Limo behind the wheel, or his son's handsome face, pallid, laid out in the parlour before the funeral, no bruises or cuts visible, his expression serene. Were it not for the small herd of exotic cows, the fancy fowl and the miniature ponies, Limo would have long ago succumbed to a solution that never left him alone. And now it was five years since Limog's wife had turned in on a Saturday night and never awoke to see Sunday morning. Soon he, like his wife, would go to sleep and never wake up, if he was lucky. In the meantime, he knew that he had to finally find someone who could devote himself to the running of the farm and the care of the livestock with the same devotion and passion as he and Con. To this end, he turned to his younger brother. Although there had been no communication between them since their mother's passing over 20 years ago, he tracked down his younger brother in the USA. At 71, his brother said he was too old to return home and way too old to run a farm. Besides that, his family was American. He had one son and two girls, grandchildren and a great-grandchild on the way. Too many commitments. All further communication attempts from the US, Limog ignored. That is, until a handwritten letter from his brother's son, Jacob, arrived. A lad in his thirties, about the same age Con would have been had he lived, Limog learned that he was a graduate of Boston College with a degree from the Center of Irish Programs. Jacob had, on leaving college, taken up a temporary post in his father's company. A temporary post that was to last 15 years. The work he described as drudgery, more interested in history, nature, the land and conservation. The prospect of running a farm, especially in Ireland, had him so excited, he wrote, he couldn't sleep. Not a man to avoid speaking his mind, Limog asked his nephew for reassurance. What was it to stop Jacob from putting the farm in the market as soon as they lowered Limog's body into the grave? He clearly understood and appreciated his uncle's position, he told him. Were things the other way round, he too would be suspicious. Papers were quickly drawn up, conferring the right of ownership of the small holding from the uncle to the nephew, with conditions. For as long as the younger man chose to remain on the property, caring for the livestock and tending to the land, the place belonged to him. Should he ever decide to leave, however, he would forfeit ownership while being legally obliged to find a replacement caretaker. The arrangements were made. It was late spring. Jacob was due to arrive in early May. It was now just past mid-April. The prospect of the young man's arrival reawakened in Limog sensibilities he hadn't experienced for years. The crowing of the red cockerel at dawn sounded in his ears as the wildest and most inspiring thing he had ever heard and the white pear blossom through the kitchen window he saw as though for the first time. On the Saturday of the last week in April, Limog awoke late, with no need to check his watch, the position of the sun through the bedroom window told him it was around midday. Not once in over 50 years working the farm had he overslept. He got up and into the day, but before he even stepped out to the cottage door, he sensed that something was wrong. No barking or whining came from the kennels. 
A thrumming started up in his ears as he worked his way to the fancy fowl enclosures. The birds were already outside in the wood in mesh wire flights. Perhaps he'd forgotten to lock them away the night before, but he really didn't think so. For a man in his mid-seventies, Limog took off at a fair pace up the gradual slope to the ridge that overlooked the lower fields. At the top, he bent over, pressed a hand against his forehead. His other hand, he rested on the wooden stile. From the fields below came the familiar yips and yaps of his three dogs. He squinted in their direction. They were gambling about among the flock of merino sheep. With them, it looked like the figure of a man. Limog clambered over the stile and made his way down the descent. Not until he was almost at the bottom of the track did his dogs come running towards him. I see him, he said to the dogs. Lie down now, go on, off with you. The three dogs turned about and bolted back to the figure in the field. Hello there, Limog said as he approached the man crouched over one of the sheep. Stray dogs, the man said, six or seven of them, but we're no match for these lads. He ruffled the coat of one of the collies. He then glanced back at the sheep lying on its side. She'll be okay. He turned back to Limog, smiled and held out his hand. The man's hand remained in the air between them longer than it should have. He dropped his hand and took Limog's from his side and pressed hard. Is everything okay? He said. Sorry, Limog said. It's just that you remind me of someone. He pursed his mouth and shook his head. Anyway, you must be Jacob. The younger man's face tightened before relaxing. He sucked in his lower lip and squinted as he twisted his head and took in the farm. That Limog hadn't expected his arrival for another fortnight, he left unsaid. Perhaps they had brought this forward. He just couldn't trust his memory anymore. Limog joked that his oversleeping was an obvious sign. He was going down the tubes. The younger man laughed and said sleep was something that catches up on every man, old or not so old. Looks like I got here at a good moment, he said. Otherwise the whole farm would have slept in. Come on, Limog said. Let's get some grub. Grand job, the young man said. Limog was puzzled by the young man's accent. He had expected him to have a cowboy drawl like John Wayne or Walter Brennan. Instead, he sounded pretty much like the people he'd known all his life. Up in the cottage, the young man insisted on cooking. With a wholesome aroma of black and white pudding, sausages and eggs sizzling on the pan, Limog did what he used to in what his deceased wife referred to as happier times. He took down the fiddle from off the wall and played a lonely air. Although nearly two decades had passed since he last held the instrument, his fingers hadn't forgotten what to do. Are you not eating yourself? Limog said when the other sat before him, a plate piled high with an Irish breakfast. I'm good, he said. He then picked up the fiddle and looked at Limog with raised eyebrows. Do you play yourself? Limog said. I did once, he said. Limog speared a piece of black pudding with his fork, dipped it into the egg and popped it into his already full mouth. The first few attempts by the young man to coordinate his fingers on one hand and the bow in the other produced a sound like a tomcat squaring up to a rival. But then his face took on a fixed expression, a wholly concentrated look. And like a child at that special moment when it shifts from its wobbly attempts to the mastery of riding a bike, his whole body adjusted. The tune that came from the fiddle caught Limog in the solar plexus, and there he hadn't heard for years. It conjured up images of the shifting seasons when winter makes way for spring. A man toughened and desensitized to adversity, Limog took a mouthful of sweetened tea to soothe the instant swelling in his throat. When the tune ended and the younger man placed the violin on the table before him, neither man spoke. Not until the set Thomas Mantle clock chimed seven or so seconds later did Limog speak. Where did you learn to play that, son? The young man tilted his head sideways and squinted towards the open door, and then he smiled. You, he said. You taught it to me. That springtime, remember? 
the time it snowed in March. An invisible hand, it felt like, worked its way through his chest plate, clutched his heart and squeezed. But just before he stumped forward, the young man pushed himself to his feet and prevented Lee Moog's head from crashing onto the wooden tabletop. Easy, boss, easy now, I've got you. Despite intense pain in his arm and neck, shortness of breath and the feeling of nausea, Lee Moog tried to speak. That's what Khan used to call me when he was a wee lad, he tried to say, but he couldn't get his voice to work and heard his words only in his head. I remember, the young man said. That was when the two old brothers used to help us with the lambing and the hay. Had he read his mind? Again, Nimog heard in his head words he couldn't form in his larynx. Aye, too good in the wear. They called me boss. And Con, he used to copy them. You're tired, Dad, he said, taking Nimog's arm, the one that wasn't painting, and draped it about his shoulder. We'll get you to bed. For two weeks, Limo was tended to by his dead son, until finally he could no longer even form in his head the words he wanted to say. It took him from darkness till daylight to explain to Khan about Jacob. Jacob, the cousin Khan had never met, arrived on schedule in early May. Khan brought him directly to his father's room. Limo listened to his son explain how he'd taken care of the boss and the farm, but that now he had to move on. Jacob wanted to know why he hadn't called a doctor or got Lee Moog to hospital. No, Khan said. This is the way the boss wants it. The other nodded, his lips pursed. That evening, while Jacob was outside tending to the livestock, as Khan had earlier instructed him, Khan played once more the air on the fiddle. Without realising it, the pain left Lee Moog's arm and neck, and into his lungs he drew a great draught of oxygen. When he breathed it out, his body felt as though it purged itself of all ailments. In their wake, a feeling of strength and invincibility. The way he felt up until that day, his only son's life ended, when he killed him through carelessness. But now he stood on his feet, his son next to him. Come on, boss, Khan said. It's time we got on the road. Time to go home. That was Stray Dogs and Cowboys, written and read by Steve Wade. The producer was Tabitha Potts. If you're enjoying our podcast, don't forget to subscribe for free so you can listen to a new story every month. Goodbye.